Welcome back to Chem Exam Explained, where the aim is chemistry clarity, exam mastery. In today's video, we will be looking at Head Chemistry Unit 2, 2021, Module 2. Let's go. Two, part A. Define each of the following terms. Part 1, accuracy. Accuracy refers to the closeness of data to the true or accepted value. Part 2, precision. Precision refers to the closeness of a set of measured values that have been obtained in exactly the same way. Two, part B. Sodium hydrogen carbonate is sometimes used as a primary standard, yet its molecular mass is only 84 grams per mole. Part B1. List three reasons why sodium Hydrogen carbonate can be used as a primary standard. One, it has high purity. Two, it is highly stable towards air. Three, it is highly soluble in the titration medium. And we can add the absence of hydrated water. To be part two. State one reason why sodium hydroxide may not be used as a primary standard. Sodium hydroxide is hygroscopic, which means it absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. It also has a small molar mass. Two part C, a student standardized a solution of sulfuric acid using sodium hydrogen carbonate as the primary standard and found the concentration of the acid to be 5 moles per dm cube. C part 1. Write the balanced equation for the reaction between sodium hydrogen carbonate and sulfuric acid. We know that the reaction between sodium hydrogen carbonate and sulfuric acid produces a salt, carbon dioxide, and water. The sodium bicarbonate must be in the solid state since it is used to make up the standard solution. It must be dissolved in water and then titrated with sulfuric acid. So it is sodium hydrogen carbonate plus sulfuric acid to give you sodium sulfate, carbon dioxide, and water. And then you balance the equation after putting in all the state symbols. 2C part 2. Calculate the mass in grams of the sodium hydrogen carbonate that the student would use to neutralize the acid. If 23.50 cm cube of the acid were used from the burette. So we are titrating the sulfuric acid into the solution of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So the first thing we want to realize is that the question want to find the mass in grams of the sodium hydrogen carbonate. So the first thing I wrote here was to find the mass of the sodium bicarbonate. It is our unknown. We know the concentration of the sulfuric acid to be 5 moles per dm cube. And we know the volume of sulfuric acid that was titrated to reach the end point. So step one, we want to find the moles of sulfuric acid. What information do we have to find the moles of sulfuric acid? Well, we have the molar concentration, which is 5 moles per dm cube, and we have the titration volume, which was 23.50, which we must convert to dm cube. So to convert cm cube to dm cube, we divide by 1,000, and then we carry all the calculation. So the moles of sulfuric acid is 0 0.1175 moles. Step two. In order to continue with the calculation to find the mass, we must now use the moles of sulfuric acid along with the mole ratio to find the moles of the sodium hydrogen carbonate. So from the mole ratio, which we got from the equation, where you'll see that the equation here is 2 to 1. So it's 2 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate to 1 mole of sulfuric acid. So that mole ratio we'll use to find the moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So if you come back here, you'll see that we have sodium bicarbonate and we have sulfuric acid. The mole ratio is two to one. So if we know the moles of sulfuric acid to be 0 0.1175, then we need to multiply that value by two 
to find the moles of the sodium hydrogen carbonate. We could look at it this way. The mole ratio of two to one is the same as two divided by one, which is equal to the moles of the bicarbonate that we want to find, which is, which is our unknown, is X. Our moles of sulfuric acid is 0 0.1175. And so we're going to solve for X. So X is equal to 2 times 0 0.1175. And that's how we find the moles of the sodium hydrogen carbonate. So if you look here, you'll see that 2 times 0 0.1175 is equal to 0 0.235 moles. And that's the moles of the sodium hydrogen carbonate. We can now move to step three, where we're going to find the mass given the moles that we just calculated. So moles is equal to mass over molar mass. So mass is equal to moles times molar mass. So the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate is equal to the moles, which is 0 0.235 mole, times the molar mass of the sodium hydrogen carbonate, which was given in the question to be 84 grams per mole. Our answer for the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate is 19.74 grams. Two part D. After conducting a titration, a student had the following titer values. You can now examine the table. You can see that we have our first reading, which was the rough reading, then a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. Normally, you do multiple titration for accuracy, and you want to make sure that your values are within plus and minus 0 0.10 cm cube for your answers to be accurate. So the first thing we want to do is to define the term mean volume. The mean volume is the average volume of the titration results found by dividing the total volume by the number of trials. So that's the definition of the mean volume. So if I want to find the mean volume for all the results here, you would sum up the, all the values and divide by the number of values. However, if you want the accurate results, we want to look for the ones that are within plus and minus 0 0.10 cm cube. So moving on to D part two, the question requires us to determine the mean volume from the tighter values. And notice in bracket, it says to be used in the calculation. So if you come back to the table, we are not going to be using all the values because all the values are not within plus or minus 0 0.10 cm cube. So if you examine the table, you'll see that the values that are within plus or minus 0.1 is the fourth reading, the fifth reading, and the sixth reading. So we're going to be summing up 25.25 plus 25.35 and 25.30 divided by 3. And that will give us 75.90 divided by 3 which gives us our mean value of 25.30 cm cube. D part three, define the term standard deviation. Standard deviation is a measure of the variation or dispersion of a set of values from the mean or the true value. D part four, using the following equation, justify the choice of the theta values selected in D part two. So this is our equation that we're going to be using to calculate the standard deviation. And once we get the standard deviation, we will be able to justify the choice of the theta values selected. Now to carry out this calculation, we'll be doing a small table. In the table, we'll have the values used and those values are the three values selected, 25.25, 25.35 and 25.30. So the first thing we're going to do is to calculate the mean, which was calculated earlier. That's the mean value. Now, in the second column of our table, we are going to be subtracting the mean from each value. Now, you'll notice that I have these symbols here. 
and this means modulus. Now, our modulus symbol simply means that all the values will be positive. Because if you subtract a bigger number from a smaller number, you are going to get a negative value. But we want all these values to be positive, so we use the modulus, which makes them positive. We are then going to be squaring those values. And once we square the values, we're then going to be adding up all those values to get the sum of the square of those values, which will then put in our equation. So once we get the sum of the values that we squared here in this column, we're then going to be plugging everything into our equation to find the standard deviation. So the sum of the x minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1, which is called the degrees of freedom, we can then put the values of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 3 minus 1. So that works out to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Once you find the square root of that value, we'll get 0 0.05. So we can now look at our mean plus or minus that value, which is the standard deviation. So it simply means that once our values fall within this range, then it is accurate and most likely precise. So the range of values are 25.30 plus 0 0.05, which gives us 25.35, and 25.30 minus 0 0.05, which gives us 25.25. So once you look at these values, you'll notice that our values that we chose are within this range between 25.25 to 25.30. So in answering the question, the fourth, fifth, and sixth values are within the standard deviation range, which means that the values are precise since the values are close to each other. They are also accurate since the values are close to the mean. Remember, precision is looking at the closeness of the data values to each other, while accuracy is looking at how close the values are to the mean or to the true value. Two part E. When 0 0.612 grams of hydrated barium chloride is heated to constant mass, 0.522 grams of residue is formed. Deduce the formula of hydrated barium chloride. All right, let's examine the question in detail. So we have 0.612 grams of the hydrated barium chloride, which means that water is a part of that salt. After heating, you drive off the water. So what you're left with is the residue and the mass of the residue is 0 0.522 grams. So if the mass of the residue is 0 0.522 grams, we can calculate the mass of water by subtracting the residue from the hydrated salt. And so the water value would be 0 0.09 grams. Now we're going to be calculating the formula using empirical formula. How do we set that out? We write barium chloride as the residue, and we write X amount of water produced. To carry this out by empirical formula, the first thing we're going to do is to find the mass ratio. Now, the mass ratio is just the mass without the units. So the mass of the residue, which is the barium chloride, is 0 0.522 grams. But the mass ratio is the mass without the unit. So it's just 0 0.522. The mass of water calculated was 0 0.09 grams, but the mass ratio of water is 0 0.09. Once heated, it is steam. However, the steam would condense back to a negligible volume, which is water, and in that case, it should be liquid. After we find the mass ratio, we must now find the mole ratio. So the mole ratio is simply dividing the mass by the molar mass of the salt. 
Now the molar mass of barium is 136 grams per mole, and we're going to be summing the values of barium with the chlorine. Now we have two chlorine atoms. So it's gonna be 35.5 times two plus barium, which gives us a total mass of 207. Once you carry out that calculation, we'll write down the values calculated, and that is 0 0.0025. We'll do the same thing for the mole ratio of water. So it's 0 0.09 divided by 18, which gives us 0 0.005. We are then going to be dividing by the smaller mole. So when looking at both moles, the moles for barium chloride is smaller than the moles for the water. So we then divide by the smaller one, which gives us one for the answer. And we divide 0 0.05 by 0 0.0025 and we get two. So the mole ratio between barium chloride and the water is one to two. So this value is giving us the value for X. So X is equal to two. So once we know the value of X, we can now write the formula to be BaCl2 dot 2H2O, which means that two molecules of water is attached to the barium chloride salt. Hence, it is called hydrated barium chloride. Two part F. To determine the ethanoic acid content of a particular brand of vinegar, a sample of the vinegar was titrated using sodium hydroxide solution. Outline five experimental steps that should be carried out to determine the ethanoic acid content of vinegar. So just to give you a visual view of what's going on, the first thing you need to do is to prepare a standard solution of sodium hydroxide, which means that we would have to weigh out a certain mass of sodium hydroxide, which we would have calculated. So we know the mass that we need to measure. Once you measure that mass, we are then going to dilute that mass into a certain volume of water to make up our standard solution. So our next step would be to measure out 25 cm cube of vinegar using a pipette. Of course, that pipette would have to be a 25 mil pipette. We will then transfer the volume measured to a clean Erlenmeyer flask, which is what we call the conical flask. For step three, we are going to be adding a few drops of phenethylene indicator to the vinegar. Now, the reason we use phenethylene is because we're now using a strong base and phenethylene is the best indicator to use whenever we are using or whenever we are titrating a strong base with either a weak acid or a strong acid. Step four, slowly add the sodium hydroxide solution to the vinegar, which is coming from the burette while continuously stirring. For step five, we would continue adding the sodium hydroxide solution until there is a color change of a permanently faint pink color, signifying the end point. This titration should be repeated at least three times until the values are within plus or minus 0 0.10 cm cube for accuracy. This is the end of module two, 2021. Please remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you will be notified. Thank you.